Are you right now at the verge of giving up on life? Do you battle condemnation and feel inadequate? Is there a part of you that doubts whether God truly loves you? Would you like to better comprehend God's love for you? Life is full of uncertainties, but in God, there is an assurance of a beautiful future. Be inspired as you receive God's word that will stir up faith and confidence in the love that God has for you. Join us today on The Covenant Light. Hallelujah. Good morning again and welcome to another edition of the Life Development Program. Today we're going to be talking about the inner image that you have about God. And it promises to be one of the most transformative um, sessions and editions of this life development program that you will be experiencing. All right, but before we go into it, we're going to first of all pray. Um, And I want you to begin to pray as I teach. So I'm going to start you off on that journey and then I begin to teach. So join with me right now. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Let your will be done in my life and that of my family. Let your will be done in the body of Christ and in my local assembly. Let your will be done on earth and in my nation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now you begin to pray in the spirit or continue in that atmosphere of prayer. And let's get into the word. Father, we ask you for revelation knowledge. I ask you to help me speak as I should. Grant me words and thoughts from heaven, undeservedly. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Glory to God. One of the most, you know, we talked yesterday, we talked about the inner image, that our lives revolve around our inner image. Today, I want to talk to you about one of the most consequential images that you need to change you need to make sure you get right you need to make sure your eye is good like jesus said if your eye is good your whole body will be full of light one area you need to make sure how you see is good what you believe to be true is good is in your image of god daniel chapter 11 and verse 32 says they that know their god shall be strong and shall do exploits. So here's my question to you. Here's my question to you. The Bible says those that know their God will be strong and do exploits. Does your knowledge of God cause you to be strong and do exploits? Have you done anything unusual? Would you say that you have taken amazing risks, exploits, just because you know God? Or is your understanding of God one that makes you approach life with caution? Try not to make too many mistakes. Try not to falter. Many years ago, as a student in secondary school, I remember my, they call them school visitors. They usually are leaders of the fellowship. And it was a very strong holiness movement. And holiness is good, but we went into some extremes then. And here's one of them. So it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. School had just closed. And I was talking to him, and he was asking after my well-being. And then he said, can I tell you something? I said, please do. He said, I've been very, very careful today. Do you know that it's been it's 2 o'clock now, and I have not yet sinned? It's two o'clock now, and I have not yet sinned. And that, and at that time, I was like, wow, this guy is awesome. Because I knew it was two o'clock, and I had sinned plenty. <laughs> you know, as, this, as a young boy in school, I have maybe insulted somebody or told someone off. But as I grew older in the faith and began to walk with God, I realized that there's something wrong with that. Even when he said it, I felt something was wrong with that. Because when I when I go home to my mom and my dad, I'm not watching every second, every minute to see that I don't miss it. Rather, 
they give me a boost and a confidence to go for things, to do exploits. When real love is in place, you feel confident to go their things. And you know that if you miss it, if you mess up, if you fail, if you fall, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. You know that you can come back to God, repent of it, and be cleansed. And you can go forth and do amazing things. Most believers are busy trying not to sin. And so they end up sinning because what you focus on is what you experience. And it's because of the knowledge we've been given about God. And today we want to influence from the scriptures only that image you have of God. So let's, let's, let's look at the word of God. Hallelujah. You know why this is important? The most consequential relationship in your life is your relationship with God. I, I used to tell the story of how my daughter, when she was three, two, three, four, would jump on a couch and fly towards me. She would, she would raise her hands and fly, knowing that I would catch her whenever I come back home from work. She will know I will, she knows that I will catch her. She will jump on the couch and she will come after me. That's not a, 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 a person going, oh, my dad is around. I hope I, had, I have everything in place. I hope I didn't miss anything. I hope I didn't mess up in any way. No, she's excited I'm around. Because, not because she thinks she's perfect, but because she knows she's loved. Her image of me, her knowledge of me, is why she can do that. Oh boy, may God help us today. Glory to God. So your, your faith is, 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 be, is built around your image of God. Your passion for God is built around your image of God. Your ability to love others is built around your image of God. Everything around your life is influenced by how you see God because it's the paramount relationship of your life. Whether you have faith and the just shall live by faith. Glory to God. So now this is there are there's a problem when we read the old testament and try to use that to form an image of god the bible tells us and we're going to start from this verse of scripture romans chapter 1 and verse 18 for god in heaven unveils his holy anger breaking forth against every form of sin both toward ungodliness and that lives in hearts and evil actions, ungodliness that lives in hearts and evil actions. For the wickedness of humanity deliberately smolders the truth and keeps people from acknowledging the truth about God. You see, Paul was writing about the old covenant, uh, uh, the, the, the time before Jesus came. <clears throat> and he was saying that because of the wickedness in the earth and because there was no redeemer no one had borne the sins of the whole world so a just god had to punish sin and that punishing of sin created an image of god that most people still have today most people if you are a typical christian and believer in your mind there is god the father who is not a very pleasant fellow then there is God the Son, Jesus, who is all loving, all nice, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers. And there's the Holy Spirit who we must be careful not to offend. That's the, the way we were God was presented to us. The Father who would say, kill all the people in Jericho, wipe out and leave no one alive in this city. Because, <laughs> you know, and, and, and thou shalt not commit adultery. And and you know, thunder and all of that that's god the father don't play with him don't play with him <laughs> but then there's jesus oh, okay he's a nice guy he's you know loving and then there's the holy ghost who jesus had told us hey be careful oh, anyone that's sinned against him it's over for you and these are all wrong interpretations and let me take that first one it's a, a wrong interpretation about god uh, when you look at the Old Testament, it's like looking at a judge in the courthouse 
and he as a just judge had to punish sin and you will see several times in the old testament where he would say don't do this yet because their cup is not yet full because their cup is not yet full so there was a measure there was a cup that had to be full so the judgment of god in the old covenant was commensurate with the deeds and the actions and because the deeds and the actions and the thoughts were wicked those deeds and actions and thoughts because of the nature of its wickedness because it was wicked and god had to judge wickedness it hid the true nature of god so it's like a judge who uh, on a particular given day had to i mean what he dealt with that day was murder cases murder cases and all the people involved were found guilty and he says sentenced to death by hanging sentenced to death by firing squad sentenced to death by the electric chair sentenced to death and he's saying it he's not laughing he's not smiling he said sentenced to death sentenced to death sentenced to death and then somebody says you know imagine if someone was there and observed and said man this guy is wicked wicked and then so this judge leaves the courtroom takes off his 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 robe as a judge and heads home as a father to his children he's heading home now and this guy runs to meet the kids at home and say you better pack your bags and run away there's a man coming he, he had sentenced 30 people to death today alone you don't joke with him you see that act of sentencing of carrying out justice hides his true nature the bible says god is love the act of 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 judging those people and making sure justice is done make if 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 you are if you do not know that person you will end up having a wrong image of him you would say he's a bad person but no he is carrying out the demands of justice the bible says god is the one that guards the paths of justice in other words he's the one that executes judgment He's the one that causes, ensures that judge justice is done. And in that role, because of the wickedness, now if men were not wicked, if there was nothing to judge, you would have seen the real nature of God. But then, the, 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 because he had to judge mankind before there was a redeemer, before there was a mediator in Christ Jesus, because he had to judge mankind, all his nature as love is hidden until you see him with his family then you know his true nature that's why there's a scripture that uh, uh, um, i want to bring to your notice in hebrews chapter 10 uh, hebrews chapter chapter 8 actually god knew about that problem the fact that his his true nature was hidden in the unrighteousness of men so he comes out and he says this hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 from verse 10 talking about the new covenant the covenant you and i are in and why he had to bring the new covenant he says for this is the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days said the lord i will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts and i will be to them a god and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor. Watch this. And every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. No, you see, they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And I said, Do you know God? Or is your image of God? Because if you truly know God, you will be strong and do exploits. Is your image of God causing you to be strong and daring things, starting businesses, you know, taking over territories, certain that you will be victorious? Is your image of God bringing that kind of a, a, a mindset, an attitude? If it's not, your image of God is faulty. And so he says here, none will say, know the Lord. And it's, look at why. He said, for all shall know me. That's why the new covenant, so that you will know him. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Why? For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In other words, the you know the the justice and judgment and having to carry out justice and judgment has caused the people to have a wrong image of me. Now, when in the new covenant, I 
put all of the punishment, the chastisement, the Bible calls it in Isaiah 53. The Bible says the chastisement for our peace was laid on him. Now, when I put all the chastisement and punishment that I should have, I should have delivered to them, when I put it on Jesus, my son, my own sacrifice, when I put it on Jesus, and so I can be free now in this new covenant that Jesus is now a mediator and the one bearing their sins and their sin offering, when I put it on Jesus, now they will know me for real. They will know the real me. And why? Because I will be merciful. Now that I have punished their sins in Jesus, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. So you see why it's a problem when someone goes to the Old Testament and says, God is a consuming fire. No. Even when it was referred to in the New Covenant, you, you check who was he a consuming fire to. He was a consuming fire to the Egyptians. He was a consuming fire to those who came against his own. And that's what any father will be. You see, God is not today a consuming fire of his children. Just like that judge is not a consuming fire of his children at home. His children have no reason to fear him. Glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. So your image of God has to change. Change into what? First, let me give you two areas your image of God has to change in. That I, over the years I found out that believers who have a wrong image in those two areas always struggle with their Christian life, always struggle with results in life, always struggle with producing the life that God wants them to have. So here are two things, two areas in your image of God. Number one, you need to change in your image of God from the God Father to God the Father. I'll say it again and I'm going to explain it. You need to change in your image of God from the image of a God Father to God the Father. You know, some years ago, I did a teaching on the God, God the Father versus the Godfather. Met, you know, so many years ago, there was this movie called The Godfathers. And they were mafia bosses and, and, and organized crime lords. And most of, most of you older probably have watched that, those movies. There were a few of them, two or three of them that came out. Godfather 1 and 2 and I think 3. So this, this movie, The Godfather, these guys called The Godfathers, they would, they would send their boys to go to, the, you know, they, 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 they carved out territories for themselves. And everyone in those territories, they expected to pay tribute to them. Even though they were not the government or neither were there any legal authority. But they would go to, you know, sh you know the, the shops and the malls and people doing business and send their boys to them and say, hey, you know what, pay us for protection. And if you refuse to pay them for protection, then they themselves will be the one that will come there, destroy your stuff at night, steal your things, destroy the business, and come back the next day and say, you know what, uh, 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 this wouldn't have happened if you had paid us for protection. Pay us for protection and we will ensure nothing happens. And if you pay them for protection, they will make sure no, nothing happens. If someone ever steals your stuff, all you have to do is say, hey, I paid for my protection, and then they will arrange for that person to uh, uh, um, return the goods and they will deal with that person because they told everybody leave this one alone he has paid and that's the mindset we have of God the God who punishes us when we don't meet up to his demands the God who says I'm going to put sickness on you I'm going to put disease on you I'm going to cause you to have an accident I'm going to cause you to die in an air crash uh, uh, airplane crash I'm going to death, cause you to, 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 to fail in your business I'm going to cause you, to, your children to turn out crazy because you didn't pay up, because you didn't meet my demands. That's the God we have been told. But think about this with me, my brothers and sisters. Who is this God, really? Let's think about God. Who is this God? In every religion that I know, from Buddhism to Islam, every religion I know, there is a deity 
one or two, one or multiple. And there are a people serving this deity or deities. And when that deity is offended, unhappy, or the, the people did not meet up to what they should do, the deity is unhappy and the people bring a sacrifice to offer to the deity. But here we have in Christianity, which is not a religion. And why it is not a religion? See, religion is men pursuing after God. Christianity is God coming after man. Bible says God was in Christ Jesus. Christianity is from Christ. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. So in Christianity, God is coming after man. God is pursuing after man. And here is the proof. In Christianity, it's the only time where you find the deity being the one who brought a sacrifice and a precious sacrifice at that. His own son brings a sacrifice in order for the humanity to have access to him. Now, will that, does that paint an image of a God who is demanding and you have to meet up to certain levels before he can love on you, before he can bless you, before he can cause you to increase? <laughs> These are deep questions we need to answer. You see, because there are questions when I ask them, people have the same answers, but they fail to re reach the same conclusions. When I ask people, is there anyone perfect? They say, no, nobody's perfect. Then I ask them, does God bless us based on our perfection? They say, no, no, not exactly. Uh, no, because most people won't say that. And so you now say, so, so does God bless us in spite of our imperfections? yeah something like that so if i'm not if i so is it is it okay then to say that god put sickness on somebody or put a disease or caused the business to fail because the person did something wrong and now they say ah yeah that that happens sometimes you see you can't have it both ways glory to god now i'm going to show you scriptures but i'm trying to prepare you for this 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 mindset this thinking of God as God the Father, not the Godfather. God the Father, not the Godfather. Many as the church has presented to us in many cases the Godfather. When the Bible presents to us God the Father, your image of God is paramount in your success from a kingdom perspective. If you go into the world to try and succeed the world way, it's a different issue. But if you want to succeed the kingdom way, like we talked about the very first meeting, the orientation, and I said, the Bible says, in, with wisdom, you will wage your own war. You don't need to try and copy the unbeliever. You can wage your own war. In other words, in your kingdom, in your own kingdom's way of doing things, you can excel. You can't excel in kingdom way of doing things without with a wrong image of God. Because your faith, the just shall live by faith. And your faith is simply the, based on having the right opinion of God. Glory be to God. So let's talk about God the Father. Jesus in painting a picture of God the Father. He says to us, he says, Which of you, if your son asks you for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? If he asks for egg, will he give him a scorpion? And he says, if you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, Matthew chapter 7, if you then being evil, verse 11, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So here is my point. Jesus said, first of all, commended or said, you guys, when your son asks you for bread, you give bread. When your son asks for fish, you give fish. You don't give serpent, 
you go you don't give snakes you don't give stones it's, and then he now made a very interesting statement he compared our fatherhood to god's fatherhood and he calls our fatherhood evil he says if you being evil in other words in comparison to god he wasn't saying that all of us are demoni demoniacs and wicked human beings he was saying that in comparison to the fatherhood of god your fatherhood is evil and if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your heavenly father how much more you know you are evil what about he that is a good father how much more and so in that statement jesus sealed the idea of god as father and you know different books of the bible and people who had encounter with god in the bible if you study the bible unveiled different aspects of god so job for instance used the the word for god called el shaddai often uh, uh, um and so you find all these names of god I, i'm almost going in that direction, but i don't want to go there you find all these names of god el shaddai el elohim uh, uh, that's the most high the most high god the the, the el elion the most high god elohim the creator god el shaddai the almighty god uh, uh, um you have uh, um el jehovah shama jehovah shama is the lord uh, uh, um our banner <laughs> glory to god the jehovah sabaoth is the lord our banner jehovah shama is the lord that is always present jehovah nisi the lord who of victory the one who fights for us glory to god and all of that you know and we like to use those names of god and they they are, they are great they help us understand that god is able to do those things but you know when jesus came he constantly used a word for god constantly read the new testament it was the word father your heavenly father knows that you need those things when you pray say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven he kept on referring to god as father he when he turned to speak to god he was he never said el shaddai he never said elohim he said always father because he came to show us that the judge has left the court room because all sin has been dealt with in christ that's why john the baptist said about jesus behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world of the world not just of christians of the world so the sin problem and the punishment and the penalty for sin has been put on jesus so the judge has no business in the courthouse anymore he's now in the family house hanging out with his kids but his kids have been told about his just judgments in the in, when he was in the courthouse and they are afraid to approach their father they don't know their father and so they are not doing exploits they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. Do you know God? Do you have the right image of him? If you do, if you see God as father, certain things immediately begin to ring in your mind. Let me talk about a few of them because I'm a father. And I remember when God taught me about fatherhood, my, my wife just had a son, my, my, our, our first child, my son. And we had, I had not gotten things ready like, you know, I wanted to. I kept on postponing, I'll buy them later, I'll buy them later. And then she gave birth. And I had to go from the hospital shopping. My wife was still in the hospital. I went shopping, I was buying all kinds of stuff. And then I was buying, before, before the child was born, and the reason why I had not even gone to buy was I was being a bit miserly. Does he really need that? Does she really need this? Does, you know, all of that. But now that I carried that child in my hands at the hospital, looked in his face, this is my son. I, you know, every father probably knows that feeling. It's indescribable. It's indescribable. You can't know that feeling and think otherwise of God. 
immediately when you understand God as Father, a lot of the teachings we hear today flies out the window. Teachings like God hears and sees every mystic, but does not hear your prayer until you have prayed long enough for it to penetrate the third heavens. But your sin does not penetrate the third heavens. Immediately you sin, bam, God is on your case. He's right there with you. He saw you. He saw the sin. Immediately you sin. But the prayer, no, he goes back to the third heavens and waits for your prayer. You have to pray, 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 and pray through, pray through, pray through. Then you finally get to God. Crazy stuff. He's looking out for my sin more than he's looking out for my cry to him. That's not fatherhood. No father even thinks that way. You have to be reprogrammed. Someone has to mess with your thinking for you as a father or a mother to see God that way. And many, we've, we've had thousands of years, at least a thousand years of people twisting the image of God. And we have to contend with that now. I carried him in my arms. I had that feeling. And I went by. I went, I, I went on a splurge. I was, if they tell me something was 200,000, another was 500,000, give me the 500,000 more. I mean, I wanted the best of everything for him. And I can imagine God watching me from heaven because something happened. So I was buying this, I was sweating, I was, you know, really spent out. And then God said to me, son, I said, sir, he said, this child you are buying these things for, what has it done for you? And I thought about it. I actually felt he had done something for me. <laughs> Like he had done me a favor. But I realized he actually has not done anything. He has not swept the house. He has not cooked once. He has not helped me shine my shoes. He has not done nada. He has done nothing for me. He says, but you're buying all these things for him. Why? I said, he's my son. And I love him. And God said, now you know how I feel about you. Now you know what righteousness is. Now you know what it means to be loved not on the premise of your performance. Boy, that stayed with me. You know, some of those encounters, you remember where you were standing on Iju Road? That was where I was standing that day in Agege, Lagos. When, God, when I had that encounter with God. And that changed a lot of stuff for me. I began to question things. I began to question the Godfather mentality that we were being served. And I began to realize the God, the Father, the God who is Father. If God truly is Father, let me, let me, let's mention, let's look at three areas where this applies specifically. If God is Father, then provisions are not based on performance. You see, as Father, I provide for my children. They don't beg me for me to provide for them. My son doesn't come singing songs of praise and worship, rolling on the floor, and then I go, what do you want? He says, can I have breakfast this morning? If you were there when that happens, you will immediately say, that's a bad man. Is God a bad God? Of course not. Why do we then feel like we need to do stuff he said to us, Jesus, talking about our father, he said, the birds neither sow nor reap, neither sow nor reap, yet your heavenly father feeds them. I am personally convinced that our provision is not based on our sowing and reaping. Our provision is not based on what we do. However, wealth and being entrusted with money, that's where faithfulness comes in, just like any normal fatherhood. In a normal father, in my, between me and my, my, my son and my, my, my daughters, they have to show faithfulness in order for me to entrust things to them. But that's not talking about their food and their school fees and, and the, their provision, what they need to survive. They do not need to beg and plead and sow and pray and fast and fast and fast and then get me in the mood to give it to them. But because I love them, there are certain things that I will wait until they, are, they can handle it. If my son says, can I have your car? I'll say, have you, have you, gone, have you gone for your driver's lesson? Drivers, do you have a driver's license? Have you gone for your driving lessons? Have you, have you passed your driving school? Are you legally allowed to drive? You see, those demands are not the demands 
because I just want to keep him from the car, but rather because I want to protect him. There are certain things. So when it comes to being entrusted, wealth is actually not provision. Wealth is different from provision. Wealth is being entrusted. That's why God will say, I want you to give to somebody else. Let me see, let me see you deal with greed so I can bring you wealth. Give to somebody, give to the work of God. Give to your pastor, give to your parents, give to the poor. And he will be, you say, God, I want. God is saying, give, 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 give. But sometimes we mix that up because of the Godfather mentality with provision. Sometimes I'm hungry. I'm almost dying. But I don't have seed to sow. That's why I don't have anything. No, God, God is able to provide. He, in fact, he gives seed to the sower. The Bible says he gives seed to the sower. Glory be to God. So even the one that lacks seed, he gives him seed to sow. My God shall supply all your needs. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The birds of the air neither sow nor reap, yet your heavenly father feeds them. He didn't demand that they sow and reap before he feeds the birds. And the birds are the pets, the pets in the house, the pets in the house. The pets in the house have been fed. You know, most people think in the father's house. He says, wash plates. No, you're not, you're not eating tonight. You're not eating tonight, but you're not, you're not going to eat for the next 10 days because you have not washed the plates. Another area is prayer. I mentioned that earlier. If God really is father, why do we, why do we need to come before him with all of these things we do, like, you know, try and play the, the image again. You know, all these things we do, we first sing and we feel like we need to get God in the mood. You see, any approach of a father for what fathers are meant to do that gives the impression that you're trying to get him in the mood to do it is either that father is a bad father or the son does not know his father. And many of us don't know God. That's why there are, no, there are no exploits. And I trust God as, as we teach and teach this more and more. And many people begin to know God. And they will know him because he's merciful to their unrighteousness. And their lawless deeds he forgets. Because they know him from that angle now. I trust God that you will come to a point where you, you turn to every major field in this world. And they will say there's a believer there. There's a believer there. There's a believer at the top of that mountain over there. There's a believer at the top of that mountain over there. You will point to any of the major mountains on this earth. The government, media, uh, 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 finance, and, and education, and all of that, and the arts. And you will find that there are believers leading there. They will begin to do exploits. When you know your father, when you know your God, you will do exploits. We come before God. Imagine my son coming to me the way we come to God in prayer. Coming to my room. You are there in my room. My son comes. He, he, he's flat on the ground and he begins to crawl. He begins to crawl. Yeah, and he begins to sing. Oh, Father, Father, I am coming to you. I am a worm, but I'm coming to you. I am stupid, but I'm coming to you. And he's crawling, crawling, crawling. And then he gets into my room. He says, oh, I'm not even worthy for you to behold me. Oh, my father, don't even, don't even, uh, I don't, I'm not even worthy to ask you anything right now. And I am saying right now, I just, you know, to, and then he begins to call me all kinds of names just to get me in the mood. You know, oh, oh, the one, the one who preaches very well, the one who teaches very well, the one who pastored thousands of people, the one who is this, the one who is that, the one who is this. And then I'm like, what is it? And he said, can I have breakfast this morning, sir? Boy. Oh boy, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. But that's the life of most people today, most believers today. We, we, when, when you see believers singing songs of worship, rather than for it to be a celebration of God, it's a hope that he will hear and get in the mood to bless them. When they call him his names, rather than it to be sons celebrating their father, it is the hope that when they call him El Shaddai and Jehovah Shammah and Jehovah Jireh, then he can provide for them. 
he will get into the mood. Another area. So we look at provision, prayer. What about hearing from God? That's another area that we treat God as God, the Godfather, instead of God the Father. Hearing from God. People say, oh, I don't hear God. I don't know how to hear from God. So let's let's look at fatherhood in that context as well. When I when I when my kids were two, one and a half, two years, where I could say something to them. In fact, when they were born, from when they were kids, when they were born, I was already communicating with them. But watch this. When they were just two days old, I would say, kuti, 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 kuti. I would pat them on the bum bum. I would hold them closely. And I'm communicating. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. And as, and as they grow older, they become two years old. I am adjusting my communication. And I'm talking to them now. I'm saying to the two-year-old, I want, I want to say, go and call your mom. I say, go to room. Go up upstairs up call mommy 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 you know and I, I call mommy is it call mommy yes call mommy okay and then he goes she goes or he goes to go call mommy you see watch this i the father had to adjust the way i communicated based on the level of my child imagine if i come to that two-year-old and said Arise, proceed to thy maternal personality and proceed to inform your maternal personality that thy paternal personality desires her presence in the immediate time. Huh? And that's the way we are made. We've been given the image we've been given of God is this person who is like that, who is, you know, who talks that way, acts that way, looks that way. And, and we have to like figure out what he's saying. But no, no matter who you are, as a child of God, God knows how to communicate with you. God does have a way he, he talks. Just like I have a way I talk. That's the way I'm talking right now. This is me communicating at my highest level. This is how I communicate. But even though this is how I communicate and prefer to communicate, I would adjust it to the level of the person I'm communicating with. If I'm communicating with my two-year-old because he's my son, I want him to hear what I'm saying, I will communicate to him at that level. I won't talk this way. So you can hear God. He's your father. Father, you know I need direction about this, but I trust you. I know that you will find a way to communicate with me. And while you are still growing in the spirit and learning and discovering how to hear God at whatever level you are, a true father will find a way to communicate with you. He's, the, he's God the father, not the Godfather. And, and lastly, I said there are two areas. So one area is about his fatherhood, seeing God as father, seeing God as father. And anytime someone says something that contradicts fatherhood, just know that's not God. That's not God. All right. The second image that you need to change that we've been fed for a long time is what I call the God of demands and no supply. Transit from the God of demands to the God of supply. In fact, if you really want to put it the right way, God is an all supply, no demand God. And I know that's, that's heavy. No demand whatsoever. Yes. God is an all supply, no demand God. Remember when uh, um, some people went, brought incense that was, that was not from God. God called it a strange fire. Offered a strange fire to God and God consumed them. God said, hey. <laughs> and it was those days when he had to punish wickedness. He considered it wickedness to bring something that he didn't give. God is the God of all supply and no demand. So that even what seems to be demands, he supplies. Let me read you some scriptures. The new covenant that I read to you earlier on in Hebrews chapter 8 from verse 10. 
Notice that in the old covenant, there was the thou shalt. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not have any graven image before me. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt, thou shalt. It was thou, thou, thou. You are to do that one. But in the new covenant, watch how many times he said, I shall. This is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Hebrews 8 from verse 10. After those days, says the Lord, I will, I shall put my laws into their minds. I shall write them on their hearts. I shall be their God and they shall be my people. <laughs> no longer shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I shall be merciful to their unrighteousness and I shall forget their lawless deeds and remember it no more. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. In speaking, the Bible continues of a new covenant. He, was, he has made the first one old. Now that which is decaying and old is ready to vanish away. Glory. So that is going away. This is where God is with us right now. I shall. So the new covenant is God doing. That's why you see scriptures. Let me give you scriptures. Ephesians 2 verse 7. The Bible says, so God can point to us. Talking about the new covenant. In fact, let me read you. Let me read you the whole. Uh, let me read you in context. Ephesians 2. We'll start from verse 6. The New Living Translation, Ephesians chapter 2. Says, but God is so, from verse 4. For God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So, this is where the verse I was reading to you now, verse 7 begins. So God can, he did all of those things. He did. He raised us. He seated us. Or it was him. No doubt shall hear. He did. And then, see, no demands. Supply, supply, supplied raising, supplied seating. So that God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So it says God is doing all of these things. God has done these things because in future ages, this is the church age, there's coming after this age, the great tribulation, there's coming after the great tribulation, the millennial reign of Christ, there's coming after the millennial reign of Christ, the uh, 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 white throne judgment, and then there's, come, there's coming after the white throne judgment, the new heaven and the new earth, and in every age after this age, God will always, God will use you and I as examples of the incredible wealth of, of his grace and his kindness. He will say, do you want to know how kind I am? Look at what I did for them. And you and I are living in that age that God is going to be referring to as the greatest demonstration of his kindness. Where he brought the sacrifice. He brought the appeasement. It's never been heard that the deity will bring the propitiation, bring the appeasement bring the sacrifice to be offered <laughs> so that there can be connection. No, it's the man that brings the sacrifice, but God brought our sacrifice. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Oh boy, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, Satan has successfully kept these things from us. But God is unveiling them. That's why we have LDP. God is unveiling them. Glory to God. You are living in that very dispensation that will be, will be referred to as the greatest demonstration of God's kindness. And you are focusing on what, you know, in your mind you are seeing the God that demands. Have you? Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you? Have you? Have you? Have you? Have you? Have you? Someone says, well, Pastor, no, does, doesn't God ask us to do stuff? He does. But he supplies. Paul said, I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God. Oh, glory to God. 
The Bible says it is he that works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Are you hearing this? So even though you see me doing, it's actually not me, but it's he supplies. So even what looks like a demand is actually because of a supply. He says love. The, the only commandment we have in the New Testament is the commandment to love. And why is he commanding us to love? Because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. There's a supply of love. There's a supply of the nature of love. You have the nature of love. And now he's telling you to love. It's like making, making an animal into a dog and asking it to bark. You are not making a demand. You are creating expression of a supply. Glory be to God. You have supplied and now you are asking it be yourself express yourself it's that's why the law of love is called the law of liberty and the law of moses is called the law of bondage because one frees you to be who you have been made to be there's a supply already and philippians 2 13 for god is the one walking in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure watch all the supply philippians 4 19 my God shall supply your every need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You see that? You can do nothing without him. Look at me, my brother. Look at my eyes. You can do nothing without him. So he's not the God, someone who knows you can do nothing, who told you you can do nothing without me. He's not, he cannot be a God of demand. He's a God of supply. He supplies and then you express the supply. That's what branches do. What really do branches do? I did a teaching one time. What really do branches do? What do branches do? Have you seen a branch go get some air? Have you seen a branch go gather some wood for fire, for food? Have you seen a branch go get some fuel? Have you seen a branch go do anything? No, the branch takes from the vine. The branch takes from the vine. Hallelujah. And so whatever you see the, the branch producing, you see the fruits. You say, oh, the branch is supplying fruits. No, the branch is expressing fruits because it received a supply from the vine. The, 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 vine. the branch, all the branch ever does is stay connected and to take from the vine. When you study the uh, biology and you find out, and I had to go look at that particular study, and you realize that the way nutrients are transferred from the stem to the branches is actually not through pushing, but by suction. The branch draws from the vine. Glory to God. It, is, it sucks from the vine. You need to take from him. You need to take from him. Glory to God. Take holiness from him. Take faith. Take, take joy. Take peace. Take everything you will need. Take from him. Someone say, what about faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. He supplied the word. So you take the word and faith comes. What about holiness? It is he that walks in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he supplies the grace and ability for holiness. It, it, it amazes me as I began to learn these things when I tell people, be holy. And they say, okay. But when you tell them prosper, they say, amen. Be healed. They say, Amen. But be holy. They say, Okay. Something is wrong with that. You see, when it comes to prosperity, oh God, you will do that one. Do that for me. Do that in me. Do that. Do that. Do that. Lead me. Guide me. Help me. Show me. When it comes to health, be healed. Oh God. Amen. When it comes to holiness, be holy. Yeah, God, you stay back. I can handle this one. I'll, I'll give you this one so you can give me health and, and, and wealth. I'll give you holiness. So you just stay back. I'll give you this one. Now, you get ready. I'm, gonna, I'm about to release some holiness. I'm, I'm about to, 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 to give you some good level holiness. God, just to give you, make, impress you. That's how we keep failing. That's how we keep struggling with sin. Oh, I, I, I will not do it again. This is the last time. 
and you know you're lying, you know it's not the last time, you're going to do it again. You're going to do it again until you learn to receive his supply. There's a supply that keeps you from doing it again. Oh, hallelujah. He's the all supply, no demand God. He makes no demands. He supplies. He supplies. He supplies. So when you hear something like a demand, over the years I've, I've learned now, that when I when when God says, Son, I want you to start praying every morning for two hours. Instead of going, okay, God, I'll, I'll do that for you. No. I say, Thank you, Father. For in saying that to me, you have released power to do it. I receive that power and I will do it in Jesus' name. Someone say, What are you talking about? Think with me. When Jesus told a man who couldn't walk, a paraplegic, and said, rise up, take up your bed and walk. Was it a demand or a supply? Think about it. Was, was he making a demand or was he releasing a supply? Everybody knows he released a supply. Because the Pharisees said, who are you to forgive sins? Because he told the man, your sins are forgiven you. Who are you to forgive sins? And he said to them, he said, so that you will know I have the power to forgive sins. Watch what I'm going to do now. Rise up, take up your bed and walk. And the man rose up and walked. And everybody was astounded because they, they were not, they didn't marvel at the guy. Nobody went to the guy and said, what? Cool, man. You got up. You walked. You obeyed Jesus. No, they didn't. <laughs> Nobody went to celebrate, celebrate the guy. They celebrated with him. But they didn't celebrate him. They celebrated Jesus. Why? He brought the supply. Everybody knew something was released in that statement. The command, rise up, take up your bed and walk, was a release of virtue for him to do that. When he told the man who had a withered hand, stretch forth your hand. Everybody knows the withered hand can be stretched. Yet God says, Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And in stretching his hand, he received virtue that saw to the withered hand being healed. So when God says to you, pray two hours every day, I want to hang out with you. Don't go, okay, God, I'm going to do it. Huh. Oh, I'm going to have to find a way to do this. No, don't do that. The same way he said, rise up, take up your bed to someone who couldn't do it. He's telling someone who couldn't pray two hours, pray two hours every day. You say, Father, I thank you. I received this by faith. The same way that guy received by faith. And you begin to do it by faith. No trust in yourself. No confidence in the flesh. The Bible puts it. The way the Bible puts it. No confidence in your flesh. You have absolute confidence in God. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm so excited. I feel virtue going out right now to all of you listening to this. I, I practically feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit flowing towards you. And I'm asking you, my brother and my sister, stand in the knowledge of God and let's begin to do some exploits. You know, I, I, I have not exhausted this. In these life development programs, programs that we do, I'm always trying to make sure I stay within an hour. And, and it's just so many things I didn't say and it's all going on in my head and I'm like, okay, but I thank God that he has spoken to you already. And that's why even after the life development program, we encourage everyone, you know, to join with us and let's, let's run through the Bible, you know. This morning time devotions, we usually, after the life development program, we just run through the Bible from Matthew all the way to, uh, uh, um, we just finished the book of Romans last month uh, before this training. And from next month again, we're beginning, I think, the book of Ephesians or thereabout. And and you would, you, you know, because when you're now looking at the Bible itself, you are able to, like, take some time and go through verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and bring reality and consciousness even more. But I thank God for what you have heard. And I pray that it will cause you to study more. It will cause you to, to challenge the thinking. Because all of this is nothing if it doesn't force you to challenge pre-existing thought patterns and to pull them down perhaps about casting down thoughts and imaginations and bringing them to the obedience of Christ 
I pray that you will do that in this time. And you need to also be careful about who you allow to feed thoughts into you. Glory be to God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to help us leave out the truth concerning what we've heard today in Jesus' name. I pray that you will cause even more the light that has begun to shine about the true knowledge of you. Cause it to come, find it into a flame that your people might walk in the light of who you really are. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining in today. I look forward to having you join me again. Till then, remember you're tremendously loved by God, unconditionally loved by Him, and because of it, you will experience His wisdom, His power, and His favor. So keep living in the consciousness of the love that God has for you. And do have a wonderful day today. In Jesus' name, amen.